I'm Lori McFarland. My ministry is called Cross My Heart. Thank you for stopping by my channel. Cross My Heart exists to encourage women to love God and love His Word. So if you'd please hit that subscribe button, we'd love for you to comment below and let us know what resonates and what you like in the videos that you're seeing. And please just go ahead and click like and let us know that you like the information that we're providing. Thanks for stopping by. If you are a decorator or maybe a graphic designer or an artist, if, or if you are one of those special friends like I have called Sandy or Brenda <laughs> and know how to decorate things and make them look pretty, <laughs> which I am not gifted in that area, but if that is your thing, then you probably know the power of the color wheel when making your space or your design pop. Those colors that are opposite one another on the color wheel, I've got one of those pictured there for you in the screen, provide contrast and they provide interest. So I actually Googled uh, the word contrast um, online and I was rewarded with a variety of images that, that popped up and they were from nature, from art, from food, from fashion. And the thing about seeing those contrasts in color and sizes and shapes and text, uh, textures, that those opposites draw the eye. And they provide a backdrop for the contrasting image to really be seen and to be showcased. So for example, looking on the screen, a red apple just seems to look much more red when it's seen against a backdrop of all those green apples. And a pair of Converse sneakers that are bright brightly colored, just really stand out amongst a line of just boring, drab, black dress shoes, right? Well, in our study this week in the book of 1 Samuel, a sharp contrast was also noted between young Samuel and the house of Eli. I want to invite you to stand now in honor of God's word and take note of some of those contrasts with me. Uh, as we read aloud together from today's, a portion of today's text, I'm reading 1 Samuel 2, verses 11 through 26. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, but the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli the priest. Eli's sons were wicked men. They had no regard for the Lord. Now it was the practice of the priests of the people that whenever anyone offered a sacrifice and while the meat was being boiled, the servant of the priest would come with a three-pronged fork in his hand he would plunge it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, and the priest would take for himself whatever the fork brought up. This is how they treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh. But even before the fat was burned, the servant of the priest would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give the priest some meat to roast. He won't accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. If the man said to him, Let the fat be burned up first and then take whatever you want. The servant would then answer, no, hand it over now. If you don't, I'll take it by force. This sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. But Samuel, here's our contrast, but Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. Each year his mother made him a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife, saying, May the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. Then they would go home. And the Lord was gracious to Hannah. She conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Now Eli, who was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So he said to them, why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons, it is not a good report that I hear spreading among the Lord's people. If a man sins against another man, God may mediate for him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? His sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with men. Ladies, thank you for standing in honor of God's word. You may be seated. Just pray with me as we start. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth that is revealed here. God, we, we want to receive it. 
We want to be grown-up women of God who open your word and see what you have for us there. And we praise you that as we finished our small groups this morning, we see how you are moving and working in the lives of all of us uniquely. You have something for each woman here that speaks exactly to her situation, exactly to her circumstance in life, and we thank you for that. Would you make us women who are hungry and thirsty for your word? Can we just never get enough? And so, Father, I just pray that your spirit would take your word today and teach us deep, profound truths from what you have for us in this passage, that it would not just be an academic study. Lord, I pray that we would grab a hold of it and own it and then walk back out these doors today determined to live it all for your glory. Amen. Okay, well, when I started to look and identify some of those contrasts that I talked about, I went ahead and prepared this chart to highlight some of those that I saw in our text today. And, and you know, it's perhaps you saw others once the, uh, the whole thought of contrast was introduced. The first noted is the return home of Elkanah, while Samuel, most likely remember about three years old at this time, remains at the temple for, to begin his new life of service. Uh, his mother Hannah had prayed for him, and now she honored her vow to the Lord and left him there. So Elkanah returns home, and Samuel stays at the temple. So that's one little opening contrast. The clear contrast seen between good and evil, almost like watching a Star Wars movie or something. There's clearly good, and there's clearly evil here. The good and evil are seen when we start to compare Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, I kind of found myself calling him Hop and Finn. <laughs> it's always been reading the scripture and young Samuel. So we're going to see that Eli's sons, obviously they were described as wicked. They were just wicked. But Samuel was ministering before the Lord. So there's that contrast. They're wicked. Samuel's ministering. Eli's sons refused to listen to their father. They didn't heed his advice. But Samuel grows in stature and in favor with God and men. In verses 12... Uh, to 17, we saw all those things unfold. We saw the documentation of all the wickedness of, Eva, of Eli's sons and all the explanation of why they were called wicked and evil. Hophni and Phinehas, the things that they did, they had no regard for the Lord. They abused the authority that they, it was the privilege that they had inherited by coming down and descending from the Levite family, that priesthood that was a privilege to them, and they did not steward that influence well. They abused it. They violated the offering. They threatened violence for anyone that didn't want to comply to give them what they wanted. They threatened to take it by force. And then that sexual misconduct that was there recorded in Scripture for us to see. So clearly, they abused their position. They abused their authority. They gratified their physical desires. They were reckless they were irreverent. Um, they simply lived just to satisfy, satisfy their lusts and their wants and their desires. There's no reining in of their impulses. There is absolutely no self-control. Eli, to his credit, did try to confront them. And, and you kind of wonder, did he start when they were three and four and five and six? Or, or was this the first time? We just don't know. But at least in scripture right here, we do see that he tried to confront his wicked sons because word has gotten back to him. People whisper, they know. And, and so it gets back to him, verses 23 and 24. We read these strong, sobering words that he uses to try to reach out to his sons and wake them up about their horrible behavior. He says, I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons, the report I hear spreading among the Lord's people, it's not good. He calls them out with a strong rebuke, and he describes their behavior as wicked, and he says it's not good. And then he goes on to say something else that I found very interesting. The very next thing that he says is he talks about if a person sins against Another, God may mediate for the offender, but if anyone sins against the Lord, who will intercede for them? Hop and Finn, your sin is against God. It's not just these women and not just the people coming to make a sacrifice. You are sinning against God. Dudes, you are spiritually up a creek without a paddle is essentially what their dad is trying to get them to see. There's no one you can appeal to here because you are sinning against God. And that should have gotten their attention. They are priests. They, they know the scripture. They should. And, and that should have given them pause 
to consider the words of their father, to think about what he's saying, to think about the repercussions, and to stop right there and repent. Uh, Samuel's words remind me of uh, David's, the first Samuel's words remind me of David's when he sinned, or Eli's words rather. So consider these words from David over in Psalm 51. Uh, Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Now this is David speaking. Um, David, King David, we're going to meet him in a few weeks. He's the second king of Israel. But David is the only man in scripture ever referred to as a man after God's own heart. But even David, the great king of Israel, the great king who loved God, the man after God's own heart, Dave, David fell into some sin. And if you come back and study 2 Samuel with us next year, we're going to study that sin that's recorded uh, over in 2 Samuel where we, we find that story. Even as the king of Israel, he, uh, he, he messed up big time. Uh, uh, j- just the highlights, it says, I think that passage opens by saying that in the spring of the year, when kings went out to fight, David stayed home. So I, I see the spiral downward starts with just kind of being lazy. And I, I would use that to teach my children about the, the danger of being lazy. So he stays home, and then because he's not working, he gets tired enough to sleep, he has insomnia. So he gets up in the middle of the night, he's wandering around on the roof, um, and he sees Bathsheba. And so he sees this woman that he wants. And he sends for her, and he... Uh, Uh, has relations with her, and she ends up pregnant. She's another man's wife. He has a child out of wedlock, and then he sets it up for uh, her husband to be killed in battle to cover up his own sin. I mean, it's pretty dark and awful what happens. And to me, it kind of starts off with laziness and progresses to adultery and ends up with murder. So, And that's just how sin is. Um, you know, people that say the Bible is boring haven't really read the Bible, right? I mean, it, some of it, if we made a movie out of it, we mamas wouldn't let our, our children watch it. But anyway, I wanted you to, to hear just a little bit of that to remind you that David, even King David, messed up big time with all of his sin. And that's what led him to pen these powerful words from Psalm 51. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And that's the truth that Eli was trying to get his sons to see. Your sin is against God. The great theologian and preacher Jonathan Edwards once said this, The greatness of an offense is determined by the greatness of the one offended. Hophni and Phineas's sin was against God. David's sin was against God. And ladies, the reality for all of us living all these years later in the 21st century is that for us too, who will sin... Our sin is ultimately against God because he's the one that sets the rules and the standards. It's his law that we are breaking. Well, Eli tried to get his sons to see that their sin was against God. He wanted them to repent. They had done wicked, horrible things. And David, too, had done wicked, horrible things. But the difference, the difference between Hophni and Phinehas and David is that David owned it. He acknowledged it. David came clean. When he was convicted, he said, I've sinned against God. And that's what we have to do. When we, it's not that we're never going to mess up, but when we're convicted, when the Holy Spirit convicts us, we have to own it. We have to confess it. We have to then receive forgiveness and for heaven's sakes move on. Uh, don't just stay in that place of languishing and, and self-condemnation. It's easy for us to go there. We can be just stuck in that place instead of moving forward. Yes, receive the conviction, but also receive the forgiveness. And, and, and forgive yourself and move on. Because ladies, if God has forgiven you, why would you think you can't forgive yourself? First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Don't you just love the beauty of that? That purification means that you are clean. Forgiveness is yours for the asking. Don't languish there. God knows that anyway. Just come clean with it. But what if our response instead is like Hophni and Phinehas? What if we refuse to listen? What if we choose not to repent? Well, 1 John 1 10, the very next verse says this. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. We've all been there, haven't we? Where there's, there have been those sins that crop up. And I'm not talking about great, big, huge sins that are 
worthy of being in the newspaper. You know, that conviction comes uh, at interesting places. Uh, you were just harsh and short-tempered with your husband. You, were, uh, you disciplined your child in anger. It's our job to discipline our children. But you disciplined in, in anger. You let your anger get away from you. Um, you were rude right back to a rude waitress. You know, it's those little things that we don't think about as sinful. But, you know, when, when that conviction comes, that thought that pops into your head or your heart that says, oh, you need to apologize, or you, you, should, you should go back and tell your husband you're sorry. Um, you, and you think, oh, and you, you argue, and you think you're arguing with yourself, or it's just an overactive imagination. Or you picture yourself in some cartoon with the little cartoon angel on one side saying, say you're sorry, say you're sorry, the little devil angel saying, he didn't mow the grass like he said he would, or she was rude first, or he didn't take out the trash. I mean, you know, it's not some little game we're playing. That voice is not your imagination or a little cartoon character. It is the Holy Spirit of God loving you enough to want you to make that right, to want you to confess what you've done and own it and go back and, and, and make restitution for it. It's God Almighty who loves you as you are but loves you too much to leave you that way. Would you listen to that voice? When you bristle up and argue and rationalize, um, you're arguing with God. That's who you're arguing with. So just stop it and own it and just say yes, sir, to God when he convicts you and then and just refuse to rationalize your sin or come up with an explanation for why it was okay to respond that way. Just agree with God. Yes, sir, repent, apologize to God, seek his forgiveness, and then go back to the one you have wronged. I got to tell you, it can be very humiliating to apologize to a store clerk or a waitress. I've done it. <laughs> I just want to come clean here. I've done that. Or to your spouse or to your child. And and it, 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 it's so frustrating because when I found myself as a young mom apologizing to my child, then suddenly we're discussing mommy's sin instead of that little sin that we were trying to address and, and, and deal with. And uh, God took me to James 1. It said, uh, the anger of man does not produce the righteous life that God requires. And so I began to realize that my anger was, make, was exasperating the situation. It was making it way worse. When I really wanted to correct my child and I was frustrated with my child, I need to get, to get myself together if I had any hope of disciplining that child correctly. So seek that forgiveness and then enjoy that cleansing and that cleaning, that righteousness that he can provide. It's like getting a spiritual bath. And then you, you get that feeling of being light and clean and living for God, pleasing God. You know, it doesn't have to come with drudgery. The Christian life isn't always hard. It can come with great blessing. And it comes with blessing when the woman of God confesses her sin. Confesses her sin. She owns it when she does wrong. She confesses. She has a teachable spirit. Uh, ladies, the Christian life is not ever about getting it right every single time. Don't lay that burden of perfection on yourself. Don't believe the lie that to be a woman of God, you've got to always respond absolutely perfectly. The Christian life is not about getting it right every time. But hear me on this. It is always about owning it when you get it wrong. It's what you do next that counts. It's what you do next that counts. We're going to mess up. We live in a fallen world. We are not perfect people. But God's spirit resides in us. And he won't let us get away with it. He will convict us. Are we going to listen to him? Are we going to confess that sin? Well, Hop and Finn, they failed the repentance test. They spiraled downward in their sin. While scripture tells us that Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with people. There's that sharp contrast again between the sons of Eli who resisted the rebuke of their father and the son of Hannah and Elkanah who continue to grow in the Lord. Samuel's heart was so open to the Lord's leading. Even with the sons of Eli all around him and their, their wicked, horrible examples, Samuel continued to listen and to learn. Proverbs 19.20 says this, Listen to advice and accept instruction, and in the end, you will be wise. Uh, Samuel exhibited an eager, teachable spirit. Uh, verse 26 tells us that he continued to grow, and that's what growing means. He was growing up physically, but he was also growing and changing in his 
personality and in his character and in his behavior. I wonder, would you say that continuing to grow describes you spiritually? Are you continuing to grow up in the Lord? Our salvation, our new life in Christ brought a new identity in him. And whether that new identity came when you were a very little girl or whether it came last week, nothing can ever change that. You are a new creation. And, and we, we contribute nothing to that equation. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. We are saved by faith alone in Christ alone. Nothing from us. It's all him. Many of us, many of you could even name the very day and the hour, that moment, that pin dot on the timeline of your life when you changed forever and you became his child. But what happens after that dot on the timeline until you go to heaven, that period from your salvation going forward, that's the result of that heart change. That's a journey that will never end until the Lord takes you to heaven. It, it launches that, that sanctification that's a continual, daily growing and changing in your life. It's not going to be a life that's trouble-free, but it's one that is abundantly blessed. One of my favorite preachers from my early married years, Dr. David Burnham, I heard say so many times, the Christian life is not the easiest life, but it's the best life. Isn't that true? I just love that. It's a life filled with joy and purpose. It doesn't just mean, being a Christian doesn't just mean that we've got this great good life waiting for us in heaven, but down here it's going to be all drudgery and difficulty and, and hardship. No, but because the purpose of that good life and that best life is to bring him glory. And when we live to bring him glory, it is a life that, that's a good life, that's the best life. I love how Dr. Nick Floyd describes our purpose when we think about our purpose. He says, Jesus created you for him. That's why you're here. It is your purpose. You were created for Jesus. Have you ever, have you ever tried to make do and, and use something for a purpose other than what it was created for because that's just what you had at the time maybe. It's like needing a Phillips head screwdriver and only being able to find a flathead and trying to use the flathead to do the work of the Phillips head. It just doesn't work and it's frustrating. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it just makes the whole thing way more difficult. Well, I believe that describes our lives when we try to take our Phillips head selves and fit ourselves into a flathead purpose, maybe, or more specifically, our created for Jesus selves. And we try to find satisfaction in anything else other than what our purpose is. Maybe it's money, or maybe it's popularity, or, or maybe it's a new car, or smart kids, or a clean house, or a new job, or losing weight, or a bowl of ice cream. I mean, what is it that makes us find satisfaction for that day? But it doesn't last, does it? It just leads to frustration. Um, nothing else is going to bring satisfaction. And once you get on that trajectory, of living for Jesus and finding that's your real purpose of growing in him, you are going to be addicted to it. i got to tell you. Because you are going to want more and more. You're going to keep on growing. You're going to be hungry and thirsty for his word. You're going to love to talk about it with other women. You're going to lose your desire maybe for TV, like my sister shared this morning, that suddenly as she's studying the word, she's just finds herself not interested in TV anymore. Because you've got this new life of purpose and joy. It's a lightness and a life of blessing. So are you ready for it? Are you living it? Are you growing in him day by day? Are you being transformed? Are you living for Jesus and fulfilling your purpose? Because the woman of God is growing in God. Is transformation taking place in your life? In verse 26, it told us that Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with people as well. So the other interesting things is as we're on this trajectory of growing with God, not only does our relationship with God, is that transformed, but just as Samuel grew in, his, in favor with other people, I believe our interpersonal relationships are also going to be transformed. The people that irritate us, we just seem to maybe deal with a little better or our relationship with our children or our spouses or those around us are just transformed in surprising ways that, that bless us and maybe bless them. 
I want to ask you, can you look back on the, the 10 years ago you, or the five years ago you, or, or the last month you, or the last week, or, or the yesterday you, and say, praise God, I ain't what I used to be. Or maybe if you're more sophisticated, you would say, praise God, I'm not what I once was. <laughs> but, but anyway, are you, are you ready to also, also look forward in the other direction? We look back at our past, and we see all those situations, and we say, wow, I'm responding differently today than I did back then. I'm a different woman today than I was then. And I praise God for that. That's his Holy Spirit. But as we look at our past, and we have all those markers nailed down, we can also look forward into our future with great hope and great expectation that I'm going to look back on the today me and say, oh, I praise God I'm not her anymore. And we're going to expect God to continue to work and move in us. And we can say, Lord, thank you that I'm not yet what I'm going to be because I'm on this journey of growing in God. I want to be different come next March when we finish this study than I am today. Every year in January, I pray that the December me would be different than the January me. I want to be a woman of God who owns my sin and continues to grow up in God. It's a delightful journey of transformation, of, of living our lives to make much of him. We were created by God, and we were created for God. And ladies, I believe that your presence, even in deciding to join us in this study, testifies to your desire to be transformed. And I'm so grateful to be on this journey with you. The woman of God is growing in God. Well, as we move into chapter 3, Samuel is continually growing fit up physically. Uh, scholars suggest he's probably most likely around 12 years old. So let's uh, remind ourselves of what the situation, what the, the, the climate of Israel at the time that Samuel was growing physically and, and even spiritually when he was growing up in the temple as he grew in stature and favor with the Lord. It says that um, the events of Samuel, remember, take place at the very end of the era of the judges. And we're moving into Israel's royal history. Pretty soon we're going to see their first king crowned. But the time of judges uh, is when uh, the, the book opens. And so our study kind of spans the end of the time of the judges, and then we're going to launch into the beginning of the, of the era of their, royal priest, their royalty and having a king. But the scripture tells us in 1 Samuel 3, 1, in those days the word of the Lord was rare, there were not many visions. So perhaps, well, we, so we know the people weren't hearing from God. But I wonder if perhaps they didn't hear from God because they didn't want to hear from God. It was a low time spiritually for the Israelites. They were God's chosen people, but they weren't hearing from God. And the reason, I believe, is because they chose to go their own way. They sought him out only when they found themselves kind of in a jam. Um, and sadly, the reality for them corporately is often our reality individually or the lives of many Christians today individually. Um, are you and I seeking after God every day, good days and bad days? Are you and I looking and listening and expecting him to reveal himself to us no matter what the circumstances of our lives bring? The scene that unfolds in 1 Samuel highlights yet another contrast. While the word of the Lord was rare for the people at large, God knew the heart of young Samuel, and he chose to speak to him. So God may be quiet to all of Israel, but we're seeing a contrast because he's going to speak to Samuel. God called to Samuel three times, and each time he ran into Eli, who he thought was speaking, and he said, here I am, you called me. Verses 5, 6, and 8. Samuel jumped out of bed, runs into his boss, Eli, the one that's in charge there at the temple that he's been assigned to, and each time, here I am, you called me. According to verse Samuel, and we, we talked about this in our small groups today, Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Samuel grew up in God's house. Uh, even before he knew God personally, he faithfully and obediently served the Lord under Eli's leadership. When Samuel heard his name called, he hopped right out of bed to respond. Isn't that interesting? The scripture tells us, or, or scholars think he's about 12 years old, but what an obedient spirit. 12 years old, and when he thinks that, that Eli's calling him, he hops right up. There's no playing possum. There, there's no grumbling. There's no sign. There's no pretending he didn't hear. He was obeying who he thought was Eli. And I think that tells us a lot about his obedient spirit and his character. Young Samuel 
his example, even before he knows the Lord, should spur us on to teach and train our children in the ways of God, even before they have a personal relationship with him. We can begin to teach our own children and grandchildren or our nieces and nephews or whatever children God may bring into our lives about God even before they know God. And we can start early. We can hedge them in and set up the likelihood that there's going to be a strong um, likelihood that they will come to know Jesus. Well, you know how I love to talk about my granddaughter. My sweet Julia Grace turns four today, and uh, I'm going to be flying down there to see her in a, in a couple of weeks and take her her presents. But she turns four today, and it's gone by so quickly. And so, of course, I'm praying for the day that she comes to know Jesus. But her parents have her in church, and she's learning Bible verses, and they're reading the Bible to her. She doesn't yet have a personal relationship, but I believe that she will, and I'm asking the Lord for that. I thought that I would share with you one of the little birthday presents she's going to get from Grammy. And I think there are things like this that as mamas and grandmamas we can do and bring into our children's lives to raise the likelihood that they too are going to come to know Jesus in some way, someday. But until they do, we can hedge them in and we can have them listen. I love this little story and I'm just going to read it to you because I thought it was so precious. And I'll share the link with you in case you want to buy one too. But it's called the Rhyme Bible. And this is the section on Samuel. It's called Samuel Listens. Hannah was sad for she wanted a son, so she went to the temple to pray for one. She promised God if he answered her prayer that her son would serve in the temple there. Nine months later, Hannah had a son. She loved her son more than anyone. But while Hannah's son was still just a lad, she took him to the temple with all that she had. The little boy Samuel, for that was his name, learned to help the people whenever they came. Eli would show him exactly what to do, and all the while, little Samuel grew. Then one night, when bedtime came, he heard old Eli calling his name. He, he ran to Eli, but Eli said, I did not call, go back to bed. Then Samuel heard the voice once more, so he ran and knocked on Eli's door, but sleepy Eli shook his head. I did not call, go back to bed. When it happened again, old Eli knew, and he told the boy what he should do. Listen, for God is speaking to you. So Samuel listened with all his might and talked with God that very night. Isn't that precious? Those are the things that we need to do before they even know Jesus. We can teach them about his word. We can make sure that our children have that opportunity to listen. We can intentionally seek out resources like this or others to teach our children. And we can pray for our children. We, we can train them up to obey and respect our authority so they are ready to obey God when they make that decision to ask him into their heart and to live for him. We can ask the Lord to empower us to live out the gospel because we know that that, that truth is more often uh, caught than taught. They're going to see Jesus in us. And, and we want to faithfully... Uh, certainly live that out to everyone in our lives, but certainly to those that live under our roof or who are in our family. We can ask the Lord to empower us as parents and grandparents to teach our little ones his ways and his will while as we pray fervently for that day that they respond to his salvation call. Your life is a living book for them to see Jesus in you. Well, after three times, Eli finally realizes this is God speaking to young Samuel. So he instructs Samuel in how to respond. When, and then when God calls the fourth time, Samuel answers this way. He says, speak, for your servant is listening. Samuel is fully engaged. He's fully engaged. He is focused. He's ready to hear what God has for him. And you know, ladies, in our world of just, there's so much noise. And we're just doing so much multitasking. There's social media. There's TV. There, we're, we're trying to cook dinner and do laundry and do our Bible study and help a kid with homework or talk on the phone. We're trying to do a zillion things all at the same time. Isn't it refreshing to know and see that God initiated that call to Samuel? And Samuel listened and responded. He, uh, he was intent and he was focused. And I think that's really how we need to be when we feel God calling us to the word of God, that we're focused. We're clearing our, our mind of the other noise and the outside distractions. Samuel's immediate, here I am, challenges us to say yes, sir, when God calls to us. The woman of God listens to God. What if we opened our Bibles each day? and repeated Samuel's words and really meant them. 
Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. You know, God's word does speak to us. And, and the joy of abiding in his word day by day and month by month and year by year is that we've got those places that we remember where he meets us. His word comes alive in those key events and circumstances in our lives. And, and if you're like me, you, you put a little date in there. And, and, and if there's a date in my Bible, I know that I can go back to my journal for that particular date. And I've recorded some things that the Lord has done and taught me. And as the years go by, when I come back to that verse, he reminds me. When I re- read Proverbs 16:9, in his heart a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. Well, that takes me back to 1993 when the Lord was using, moving my, my family. My husband had been laid off from GE aircraft engines when they lost a big military contract. And so we were leaving the corporate world behind and, and moving to the world of academia as he was going to teach at John Brown. We are leaving a big city and moving to a small town. We're moving far away from everything familiar. And as we pressed in and prayed, that was the verse. In his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. It was all the more precious to me, I remember, because it's 16, the reference is 16-9, and my birthday is November 16th, and my husband's is June 9th. So I just thought, Lord, you've got such a, per, a, a sense of humor to make it clear that that was for Kevin to be both as we moved. I remember uh, 20, no, not 20, about 11 years ago, 12 years ago, can't remember, uh, my youngest daughter was diagnosed with juvenile diabetes, and it was a horrific time for us. And the verse that the Lord took me to is John 4, 5. This sickness will not end in death. No, it's for the Lord's glory that God's Son may be glorified through it. And every time I come across that verse in my study, I'm reminded of his faithfulness and how he spared her life. And there was no organ shut down. And there was no brain damage. That n- nothing scary that happens when blood sugars are over 800 and you're being rushed to Children's Hospital and in ICU for days. She was spared. And the Lord used that to call her into the field of nursing. And, and she's a junior at John Brown today, majoring in nursing. I, when I come across 1 Thessalonians 5.24, this is the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. I'm reminded of stepping out to go and lead a group of women to the, to, to the Arkansas State Women's Prison and to walk in there and share the gospel and teach, and knowing that it was not me that was doing it. It was the faithfulness of the Lord. It's a joy to be a woman of the word, to have the Lord give you a scripture, to claim that scripture, to pray over it, and to see him provide and see him answer. As we say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And he does speak to us through his word. He is ever faithful. We can each declare with Samuel, here I am, Lord, speak to me. So I want to ask you, what hard thing, you know, what hard thing are you going through? And would you say to the Lord, You know, what hard thing do you have for me today? Is there a hard assignment that you have for me? How can you use this hard thing in my life and and use it to glorify yourself? Lord, is there a difficult person I'm to love on? Is there someone who needs encouragement? Is there there someone that needs to hear the life-giving message of the gospel? Lord, what what rough corner on the edges of my personality needs sanded off a little bit? I want to respond in a way that honors you. Uh, What behavior needs needs worked on, Lord. More wrinkles need to be smoothed out in, in my thoughts and in my attitudes. And as we have that teachable spirit, and as we listen, and as we aren't just choosing to be readers of the word and hearers of the word, but doers of it, we will find that transformation take place. We will become conformed to the image of our Heavenly Father. The woman of God listens to God, and then she follows where he sends and obeys what he tells her to do. Samuel's teachable spirit was rewarded because his heart was open to hear God. God spoke to him, and God continued to speak to Samuel throughout his life. At the end of chapter 3, we read this. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. Samuel's life unfolded in power. He was a man of God who stood firm to advance God's kingdom, and he was used mightily by God. And I believe that God wants to do the same with us. I believe he wants us to be women of God who stand firm for his truth and are transformed to his image and make a difference in our world where we live and move. What if you and I opened our Bibles each day and prayed, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. What if we chose to be all in, 
to jump up and run when God called, just as Samuel jumped up and ran and said, here I am, you called me. What if we chose to hear him and then immediately obey him? Shall we try it? I wonder that if we chose to be all in, would there suddenly be this contrast in our lives? Would that be seen by those in our world? Would there be a clear distinction between how the woman of God responds and the woman of the world responds? Would others see our good deeds or take note of our our lack of anger or see us open our mouth and then listen to the Spirit as we close our mouths and we just swallow those words that were so quick to pop up? When we walk through the valley of difficulty and pain, do we respond differently? Do others see us walking through it with Jesus? And does that even give us an opportunity when people say, why and how can you do that? We can say, because Jesus was with me because he loves me and he met me there and he carried me through it. Do we look and sound and think and behave differently on the outside because we have Jesus on the inside? Are you ready to woman up and behave like the woman of God that you are, not because of you, but because of the Jesus who lives in you? Pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for abiding in us. I pray that every woman in this room knows you, that your Holy Spirit has transformed her heart, and she knows that she knows that her identity is in Jesus Christ, that her place in in eternity is secure. But God, we, we know that the gospel is not just for that day when you take us into heaven, but the gospel is for this day. The gospel makes it possible for us to live powerful, transformed lives that are for you, that make much of you, that bring glory for you. Father, I just pray that the reality that we were created by you and for you would sink down to deep in our hearts and profoundly change how we live our lives this day and every day. Father, let there be a contrast to the old me and the new me and the future me. I pray that that transformation is seen and that we just thank you that you are a gentle and kind teacher. Thank you for loving us just like we are, but loving us too much to leave us where we are. We pray this in the sweet name of Jesus, God, your son and our savior. And all God's daughters said, amen. Have a great week, ladies.